Today I have a very special guest here in studio. I have Tosca Lee who's written a book called Demon and Lamar. And you know, we were just listening to people talk about whether or not the spirit world was real. I remember a time I was laying in my bed and I heard a little voice whisper out loud to me, who do you think you are? I was so angry when I heard it, I sat up and I said, I am a daughter of the king. And I said, you leave in the name of Jesus. The next day when my friend Marcia came to see me, she said, I had a very strange experience last night. I said, what happened? She said, I was laying in bed and I heard a voice speak to me. And he said, who do you think you are? And I said, oh, what did you say? And she said, I told it I was a daughter of the king. And I told it to leave in the name of Jesus. Just this weekend, I was up in the mountain community of Frisco at Rocky Mountain Community Church. And I heard the pastor talk about just coming back from Uganda. He was getting ready to speak. And he heard in his heart that same accusation. Who do you think you are? Well, I want to tell you, if you've ever heard that question, you are a child of the King. And we're going to talk about that today. And we are going to open your eyes to show you the grace and the beauty of being set free from the work of the enemy. I want you to welcome with me Tosca Lee, a former Mrs. Nebraska. Welcome. And Thank she you. has written a fabulous a uh, book called Demon and Memoir, Memoir. And this book so reminds me of, of the C.S. Lewis work, uh, Screw Tape Letters, which I love. And she's taken a very clever look at rolling back the spiritual realm and looking at that story, that plot, what the enemy is trying to do to you. Welcome to our show, Thank Tosca. Thank you so very much. Tell me a little bit about the plot behind this book. Okay. Well, it begins when Clay, who's a small Boston editor, walks into a little cafe. This takes mm -hmm. place in Cambridge, mm -hmm. uh, Massachusetts. And a man approaches him and says, you're late. I've been waiting for you. Ooh. And of course, Clay isn't quite sure what to make about this, but he thinks that maybe this, this man is a writer trying to get published because Clay is an editor. Um, so after that strange experience, Clay goes away. And this, this person, this persona, this thing keeps appearing to Clay, but in different guises, sometimes a woman, sometimes a man, sometimes old, sometimes young, and keeps telling him a little part of the story, starting with the time before the fall of Satan. Ooh. And then up until the time of creation, up until the creation of these clay people that he finds to be so hideous and so terrible and gross, and up until the time of the Messiah. So telling the story, um, from his point of view. So actually Lucin is a fallen angel yeah. and he's not actually Lucifer, right. but he's there to, to what to Clay? What's he trying to get Clay to do? Well, on the surface, he tells Clay he wants to have his memoirs published. Oh. So hence it's a, a memoir. And uh, of course, Clay recoils and says, I want nothing to do with this, even though Clay is not a believer necessarily in God because he's always been a, a good person, which you know he always felt was good enough. And um, so Clay recoils, but Lucian continues to, to come at him with this story. And Clay says, why do you keep coming back to me? And Lucian says, because our stories are very closely interconnected. Mm. We have a lot in common. Ooh. So Clay becomes obsessed with the story after that. So in other words, this is the story of Lucian and his fall from grace. Yes. And what he's trying to do with Clay, I love the name Clay, <laughs> is he's trying to tempt Clay into a fall from yes, grace. And absolutely. that is why the stories are so connected. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about uh, the fall of, of Satan and how that affects t people today. Mm. Well, I have always felt that Satan is is not out to make numbers as far as trying to, you know, keep people from getting to heaven. You know that, that old song, the devil went down to Georgia, he was looking for some souls. Um, it doesn't work that way. It's not an incentive program. It's not a, you know, a tally keeping thing. Um, the real reason that Satan doesn't want people to come to belief or to go to heaven is simply a grudge against God. Revenge. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so... There are so many pitfalls, I think, in life today that will, will try to tempt us off the path of truth mm -hmm. to 
so that we can be another trophy mm -hmm. in Satan's trophy case. Mm -hmm. How do we know how to stay on the path? Well, I think first of all, you pray for discernment. Mm -hmm. um, without that, you don't have the ability to see through things because I'll tell you, my, my theory, um, which I got from a friend of mine, Greg Steer, uh, uh, Dare to Share, um, he said, you know, Satan's drop dead gorgeous mm -hmm. and sin is gorgeous too. Um, if we could see through it, if it were so inherently ugly that we would run away from it, then we would always know. So first of all, I think we, we pray for discernment and then we look out for those things that, you know, they're appealing. You know, it always seems like a good thing at the time. Mm -hmm. When you eat, ate the fruit, it seemed like a good thing to do at the time, mm -hmm. right? So. That's right. So we have to be on guard. And mm -hmm. how can we follow Christ in such a way that we will not fall off that path? Well, I think we need help. Um, I don't think we can do it by ourselves. And you and I were just talking too about the, the power of having people pray for you. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that God built us for community, mm -hmm. um, a relationship not just with Him, but with each other. And so I think we have to lean heavily on other people. We need to be praying for one another and we need to be praying for the people in our lives mm -hmm. because the enemy does go around like a roaring lion mm -hmm. seeking whom he can devour. Mm -hmm. And it can be so tricky. I was talking to my plumber and he was telling me that he had gone to, to do a project in the foothills here in Colorado and when he opened the door to the crawl space that the entire crawl space rattled. And he said to the homeowner, he said, I will not come back back until you clean up your act. And I think it's the same with us. Mm -hmm. When we want the power of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us, we have to watch out and make sure that we haven't been caught in sin mm -hmm. and we can clean up our act. Not that that makes us perfect before God, but it helps us to hear His voice mm -hmm. in our life. Mm -hmm. And how would you recommend a person really hear God's voice for them? Gosh, you know, I, I find, and I hate to admit this, but I find that God speaks most clearly during the most difficult times. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if you're going through a difficult time and if you're experiencing pain, um, that's when God is really giving you the opportunity to hear His voice and to learn something. Um, because when things are feel really good and, and we're doing well, often I don't think we learn very much. So I think we have to listen during those moments of, of pain and, and trouble. So you're saying pain can be a good thing? I think it can be. Not, it doesn't feel good at the time, yeah. but I think it can be. And what yeah. do you do though when, when you have things come against you? I know you had a few things come against you in this book. <laughs> yeah. And what, what did you do? How did you overcome? Mm -hmm. Well, much like you, I prayed first of all. I prayed that prayer so many times because it happened with small petty things in my house first. You know, the water turned blue in my house, mice infested my house. I mean, little petty things like that, you know, where I thought, what's next? Locusts at 11. And uh, <laughs> what's going to happen? And you had but, major things too. And then major things too. My marriage was attacked. Um, I am single today because of that. Um, and I think, you know, we just, we put our faith in the fact that we are children of the one that is greater. Um, I think that we pray that prayer a lot, you know, by the authority of the blood of Christ. Mm. Um, we pray that prayer, um, believing that we have that authority. And we ask others to pray it for us because by golly, we need that. Oh, we do. We do. I pray it all the time. I mean, you know, we walk through this life thinking we can, we don't have an enemy, but we do. Mm -hmm. And he is seeking to, to trap us, to trick us, to just even give us grief. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the keys to really avoiding those kinds of pitfalls is to keep our eyes off of ourselves, mm -hmm. keep our eyes off of the problem and really focus on the beauty of Jesus mm -hmm. and to focus on the grace mm -hmm. that He has given in our life. What would you say to that? I think that we take grace for granted. Mm -hmm. I think that this idea that, you know, Jesus died for us, you know, God loves us, that this can become kind of a, a drone sometimes in the background because it's so much a part of our, our, you know, our culture, especially in church. You know, I think we have to revisit it in order mm -hmm. to keep it fresh and new. Um, and to remember, what does that grace mean? And what could a life without grace be? And I, I tried to illustrate that here in this book by you know, showing a life without grace and to say how fortunate we are mm. to have it. What made you think, why did you write this book? Mm. 
Well, you know, I live on the edge of town in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I have to say, I was Mrs. Nebraska 10 years ago, so now I'm kind of a has-been. <laughs> but, I don't think so. <laughs> but I was living on the edge of town, and I had this long stretch of drive, which is a great time to think, if, if you can turn your cell phone off. And I was part of a collaborative story writing group, and I wanted to come up with a new character to write about. And I thought, why don't I write about an expatriate angel. Ooh. What would that be like? And would I go around tempting people to, you know, steal petty cash and smoke or, you know, things? <laughs> and I thought that's that's not real. You know, I don't think it really works that way. So how does it work? What would it be like to have a life where grace is not available to Ooh. you, and you're you're damned for a single failing moment? Mm. And then, how would you feel towards the people that God created and offered us all to? Ooh. And then I had a story. <laughs> yes, and that single failing moment was when that demon, who was a cherub, an mm -hmm. angel, mm -hmm. took his focus off of God Almighty, mm -hmm. Jehovah, turned and turned it toward it. himself yeah. and Lucifer yeah. and began to feel the adoration toward something other than God. It, it's, yeah. it's a false idol, a false God. Mm -hmm. And that's the danger. Mm -hmm. And how do you think we today can fall into that danger? What are the, what are the oh. things we need to watch out for? Well, distraction, and mm. I think that that is one of the favorite tactics of the enemy. Um, you know, we can look around at terrible things that are happening, and they're so obvious, you know, terrible things in the world. And what happens when they happen? People pray. And I think that Satan is a little more insidious than that. And I look at things like our busy schedules, mm. um, our, our children's schedules, um, our, our lives, our lifestyles, trying to get that nice house with the two, three, you know, stall garage, you know, trying to go on those nice vacations. Um, and before you know it, the day's gone, we're dead tired, and we haven't had time to think about those things that matter beyond today, this year, 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. right? You know, I like to, when I wake up in the morning, it is to turn my thoughts to God immediately. Mm -hmm. And I love to, to ask Him to guide my path and then to be in dialogue with Him yeah. every day. And if we don't live our life in the presence of God, those distractions are going to come. Now you talk about seeing God in a new light or seeing the demonic war between God and Satan in a new light. Can you yeah. shed a little light on that? <laughs> well, that's what, what I try to do. There's a scene in the book where Lucian takes Clay to a prominent neighborhood, Belmont neighborhood in Massachusetts outside of Boston, and they look at this beautiful house, and this house symbolizes all that Clay has hoped to achieve and you know the thing he wants to get in his lifetime. And in front of Clay's eyes, it starts to crumble, it starts to fall apart, and it's demolished, and there's nothing there but the earth as it was, and it, it just wipes away everything. And I think about this thing that a, um, a, a fellow Mrs. Nebraska used to say to me, and she used to say, will I be able to make a difference for eternity? Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to learn to put on a new set of goggles, and I think we have to look at things through that lens, because when we look with temporal eyes, we're myopic. I know I'm extremely myopic, so legally blind even. So I think we have to look with new goggles. Mm -hmm. And we have to look at what God is doing and, you know, always keep Him before us mm -hmm. and not think that, well, God is an afterthought mm -hmm. and not run around and, and live our lives without Him, but include Him. Yeah. Uh, one of my, I have a disabled daughter and one of the therapists that comes to our house says that every morning when she gets into her van to travel Boulder County to visit with the disabled children that she works with, she always clears off a spot next to her seat and says, Lord, you are welcome mm -hmm. to join me. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to be doing. Mm -hmm. We need to be welcoming God mm -hmm. into the everydayness mm -hmm. of our lives. Mm -hmm. And we need to continue to focus on Him and to watch out for those distractions. Mm -hmm. But now you were saying earlier that, that evil and Satan, that there's a little bit of mystery there. And I'd like mm -hmm. to ask you to help clear that up. Mm -hmm. Is it really a war between good and evil, God mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. Satan? What is going on there? Well, it's that, you know, we think about the quintessential war of good versus evil. I mean, it's in our culture everywhere. It's thematic in all of our literature, Star Wars. I mean, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to clear up a few things when I wrote this book. One of those being that Satan is the evil opposite of God. He's not. He can't be because God created him. Mm -hmm. You can't be the equal of the creator. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Um, if you interpret Ezekiel 28 as being about the fall 
of Lucifer, then it talks about Lucifer as an anointed cherub, cherubs being very high ranking and anointed being extra special. Um, and when you look at that, you realize he's not a fallen angel. He is a cherub, so that's something different too. Um, so I wanted to clear up some of these things that we kind of slide around without real accuracy. Um, I wanted us to remember too that Satan can masquerade as a, an angel of light. Mm -hmm. So he's not always, you know, he doesn't have horns, he's not red, you know, <laughs> he's not, you know, he's not that obvious. So. Interesting. Well, you know, yeah. it, Satan was Lucifer, he was the, the choir director mm -hmm. of the worship choir in mm -hmm. heaven. Mm -hmm. And his sin was really not being evil, right. it was actually the sin of pride. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the same sin mm -hmm. that Adam and Eve were tempted with in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. You know, don't listen to God, listen to me. If you eat the forbidden fruit, mm -hmm. you will be like God. Mm -hmm. Again, it was pride. Mm -hmm. So pride obviously is something we should really watch out for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that? I'd say that we need to be, we need to be careful about it. I mean, it's one thing to be proud in our, our place, you know, in God's family. That's a different thing. But I think that we need to make that distinction too between um, Satan said, you know, five famous I wills. You know, I will take my throne up to heaven. I will ascend beyond, you know, the Mount of the Almighty. But something happened when he actually acted on it. Um, and I think we need to be careful because we can, we can cross that line. So, but it starts right. when we do it in our mind first mm -hmm. and then we cross that line. And Eve did that too. She was tempted first but then she took and ate it. Right. So. Right. Well, we're going to all be tempted. Yeah. But we got to keep our focus on the Lord and not on ourselves and, and not on the temptation. And then it's going to be easier for us to make it through yeah. and then to understand the gift of grace mm -hmm. because no one's perfect. No. I'm not perfect. Oh, no. Yeah, I'm not either. <laughs> no one is. That's why we <laughs> need the Lord. And, mm -hmm. you know, I like to imagine what it, what a, what, what it was like for Lucifer when that heaven heavenly choir that mm -hmm. he had once directed sang over the birth of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he had to have known that something was wrong with his kingdom, the little kingdom he had developed. Yeah. Yeah. And it was all coming crashing down. And rejoice, not that you have more power than the demons, but because you have grace in your life. And Tosca, would you tell us a little bit more about the importance and the wonder of grace? Ugh. There, there's so much to say about it, but you know, the best way to appreciate it is to imagine what a life without it would be. You know, to, to know there was no hope, there's nothing you could do, there's nothing you could accept. You know, to, to have no grace, I mean, to think about what that would be. And then I think that we can come back and be extremely grateful for what we have available to us. And how do we get that grace? We ask. That's it. <laughs> in whose name? In the name of Jesus. <laughs> Who died on the cross died on to the cross. save us from mm -hmm. our sins. I mean, like we were saying, I'm not perfect. Tosca's not perfect. Far from perfect. <laughs> we need a savior. Yeah. We need someone who can pay the price for our sins. And that is what grace is. Mm -hmm. Tosca, could you lead our viewers into a prayer mm -hmm. of grace? I would love to do that. Holy Father, I just pray that you would help open the hearts of everyone listening. I pray, Father, that everyone seeking you and those who are not yet seeking you, that you would stand at the door and knock and that they would know that you are there. Holy Father, I pray that you would help them to understand grace, help them to understand what it is that you've made available, that great gift, that great...